Blog Talk Radio. Domestic violence is not a gendered issue. It simply is not. Men and children are its victims about as often as women. And the dirty secret is most domestic violence between adults is mutual. On this show, we'll be exploring the intimate, painful, and vitally important topic of abuse within the family. We'll be sharing our perspectives and your own. We invite you to call in and discuss your views and experiences on the subject. Anyone of any age, sex, sexual orientation, or religious background is invited to call in to talk. We may not get to everyone, but we will do our best within the show's allotted time, and we plan on being here regularly. Before we begin, I thought I'd tell you about our show host. Erin Pitsy was born in 1939 in China while her father was stationed there as a member of the British Foreign Office, along with her mother and siblings. After being captured by the Japanese, Erin left China in 1942 and lived in the Middle East prior to her arrival in England in 1946. In 1971, Erin opened the first women's refuge specifically to help female victims of domestic violence and their children. Although what she found there, and what decades of research, decades of research, has shown since then, more than half the women in her shelter were violent people themselves. Over the years, she tried to also create resources and safe spaces for men, but met with a lot of indifference and even hostility toward men suffering in this area but it's a passion she continues to hold to this day for men, for women, and especially for their children. Erin is the author of Scream Quietly or the Neighbors Will Hear, the first internationally recognized popular book on domestic violence, first published in 1974. That book, along with newspaper, magazine, and television stories to report on her work, helped to spark an international movement to help battered women a once taboo subject. In 1979, Erin came to the United States at the invitation of the U.S. government and embarked on a Salvation Army tour of 21 cities to help up set up shelters for victims of domestic violence there, too. Erin moved to the United States in 1982 to open a shelter and lecture on the subject of family violence. During that time, she also wrote and published novels, as well as works of nonfiction, though she was consistently thwarted in her efforts to find direct ways to help men, or even raise attention to the issue of men in domestic relationships. One of Erin's books, Prone to Violence, was subjected to a campaign by radical feminists to steal it from bookstore shelves and destroy it, so bookstores would be afraid to carry it and would lose money if they tried. A feminist publisher at Harvard Collins eventually told Erin that she hated her books and would see to it that they would all be taken out of print and that she would never be published again. This threat was successful, at least until her book, This Way to the Revolution, was finally published a couple of years ago by Peter Owen Publishers after 10 years of being rejected by most major publishers. This Way to the Revolution is a history of the early women's movement and their hijacking of the domestic violence movement. To this day, Erin is still regularly attacked and even slandered for making an assertion even though it should not be refutable. After all, it's the documented truth. In intimate relationships, men and women are equally violent. We would like to take a moment to urge that if you wish to call in to share a personal experience to the show, you probably want to keep things on a first-name basis, probably even use a pseudoname for yourself or any family members, so there's no concern about someone coming after you or, for that matter, suing us. But we want to hear your personal stories and reflections. Welcome to Domestic Violence Revelations with Erin Pitsy. The truth about domestic abuse is often a painful to hear, but in truth, there is hope, and we hope you'll stick around to hear it. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Episode 5 of Domestic Violence Revelations with Erin Pitsy. 
My name is Dean Esme. Glad to see you all again. Say hello to the nice people, Aaron. Hello. We're having a heat wave in England. Are you really? Yeah. I didn't think they had those in London. And also joining us today is our friend uh, Andy Thomas from MRA London. How are you doing, Andy? I'm good, Dean. How are you? I'm pretty darn good. And actually, before we kick off the show, um, there's a few things uh, we want to get out of the way. First off, so everybody knows, we're going to be mostly focusing today less on domestic violence, um, although this that subject touches on this or this subject touches on it as it does on a lot of things. We're mostly going to be discussing the phenomenon of what are called men going their own way, um, which for some people is an actual philosophy, and for others it's just a default status, not something they're doing as a philosophical choice, just something they're doing and why that is. We're going to be featuring some stuff with a or by a Dr. Helen Smith, which I'm sure uh, many of you heard of, have heard of, but many will not have heard of. Uh, Aaron and I did a, a, a lengthy interview with Dr. Helen uh, about two weeks ago, two weeks ago Sunday. We're going to just go ahead and play that interview. We've also got an ad for her book um, and a reading from her book. So we're going to have lots of Dr. Helen, even though she can't join us live today. Um, Andy Thomas is the head of MRA London. He has an announcement for us, and what he's also going to be doing is reading from an article he has recently written on the phenomenon of men going their own way and what it means. So, Andy, would you first like to uh, give us your announcement? Indeed, I would, Dean. Um, I would like to announce that very shortly, MRA London will be um, becoming a voice for men UK. Um, we are the we are we always have been the official branch of a voice for men in the UK, and um, in over the next few years that's going to be recognised on our website. Um, and the, the, the website address is going to change, but um, the old the old address and the old links will still work. So, in other words, you are essentially rebranding. Exactly. And instead of being known as MRA London, you're going to be known as a Voice for Men UK. Exactly. And there'll be a new uh, people will be able to go to a VoiceForMen.co.uk or, or something like that. S similar, it'll be a Voice for Men um, dash UK dot com actually. Oh, okay. A Voice for Men dash UK dot com. I'm sure that'll work too. Um, I see an interesting. Uh, question here in our chat room, uh, which is uh, from somebody calling himself Warhammer saying, aren't MIGTOs not liked by MRAs? Um, uh, now, MIGTO is something I just said, and a lot of our audience will not know what that means. That's a pronunciation of an acronym, M-G-T-O-W, which stands for Men Going Their Own Way. And those of us who are savvy of it often just say MIGTO, for short. Um, Warhammer asked, uh, aren't MIGTOs not liked, by which I assume he means disliked by men's rights advocates? And the answer is, why, yes, Warhammer, we hate you with a steaming passion and wish you to be destroyed. <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, it is the radical opposite of the truth. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we're going to be featuring an upcoming article on that very phenomenon on A Voice for Men soon. Um, it's our position. Actually, we think that if you look at the history, you'll find that uh, the men going their own way as a philosophical movement started in the men's rights advocacy community. And at least on A Voice for Men, most of us see no conflict at all. It's a matter of, of, of approach. Um, I, I think most of us on a voice for men, saying MIGTO is an honorable choice um, and a reasonable, rational choice. Um, although we don't all identify that way, we support our MIGTO brothers, even if sometimes we have arguments over certain specifics. Um, uh, we view that, even those so-called arguments, as necessary debates to have, not any sort of war. We have great respect for most of the MIGTO community, although there's crazies everywhere. 
definitely there's no dislike there. Um, Andy's got an article on the subject that he's going to be sharing with us, but before we do that, I want to play and talk a little bit about the new book from Dr. Helen Smith called Men on Strike, which is about why men are opting out of not just marriage, but in many ways, mainstream society. Um, it's a short ad for her book, which is a phenomenally good book, and I strongly recommend everybody read it. Every MGTOW ought to read it, because here's a mainstream author from a mainstream publisher who's pretty much got it all right, which is almost shocking to see. Helen gets it. Uh, James, can we play that short ad for uh, Helen's book? Today, more and more men are choosing not to go to school, not to get a job, and not to get married. If similar numbers of women were doing the same, someone would raise the alarm. But since men are the ones opting out, the problem has been mostly met with silence. Some books say that men are just a bunch of lazy, stoner frat boys who are acting immaturely. In reality, men are acting rationally and opting out of education, work, and marriage because in all of these areas, the penalties are high and the rewards are low. Each of these areas has its own problems and is important in its own right. But for now, we'll just look at why men are avoiding marriage and fatherhood. The first reason that men don't want to get married is that they'll lose respect. In the past, a man wasn't considered a true adult until he was married and had children. Today, however, husbands and fathers are the butts of jokes, and the media constantly portrays them as buffoons and bumbling idiots. The second reason is that they'll lose out on sex. Men who cohabitate with their partner but aren't married have much more sex than their wedded counterparts. Recent studies have also found that cohabitators are happier and more confident than married couples. The third reason that men don't want to get married is that they could lose their children and their money. Men are aware of the dangers of divorce, specifically that the courts tend to favor mothers. Men only get custody of their children 10% of the time and overwhelmingly are responsible for paying child support and alimony. The fourth reason is that men will lose their space. Once a man gets married, he's relegated to the dirtiest part of the house, the attic, the basement, the garage. The entire house is supposed to be a shared space, but the rise of the man cave means that the home is increasingly becoming the domain of only the wife and children. The fifth reason that men don't want to get married is that they can lose their freedom. If a man gets divorced and can't afford child support, he can get locked up. On any given day, there are almost 50,000 people in jail due to child support arrears, most of them male. For example, in Massachusetts, 96% of the people incarcerated for unpaid child support are men. The final reason that men don't want to get married is that the single life is better than ever. In the past, single men were looked at with suspicion, but this is no longer the case. There are plenty of 40-year-old bachelors. Employers look favorably at employees with non-conflicting family responsibilities. Dating has gotten easier, and premarital sex is no longer taboo. On top of this, there's more to entertain single men today than there was in the past, with video games, cable TV, and the Internet providing diversions not previously available. To recap, men are opting out of marriage, in addition to education and work, at alarming rates. This isn't due to laziness, but due to rational choices where men no longer see the value of participating in these areas. People respond to incentives, so if we want more men to marry, it needs to be a more attractive proposition. All right, now that, that is an issue the public for uh, men on uh, Helen Civics. Um, and as I have a view with her, that will we'll be there. Uh, it also points this this show also points to a change in BC. Uh, uh, we are probably are changing the title of this show just so you all know to Revelations with Aaron Pitsy because while we remain very passionate about the subject of domestic violence and you can hardly talk about feminism and gynocentrism and their impact on the world without looking at the state of domestic violence. Uh, but 
there are other things to talk about, and most of this show is going to be about some of those other things, and we expect that on future shows. So we're just shortening the name to Revelations on future episodes. Uh, so that's two name changes. This name show's name is changing, and MRA London is changing to A Voice for Men UK. So with that said, um, I'll also point out to, that Dr. Helen published a piece on A Voice for Men recently, which I think was – even a longer version of that ad, wasn't it? I think it was something like eight reasons. So if you look for Dr. Helen Smith's eight reasons men are avoiding marriage, uh, that's also on the avoiceformen.com main website. Now, I've seen some real pushback against, uh, some intellectual pushback against Helen Smith's book, uh, at least on the Amazon interview and the Barnes & Noble interviews online. But otherwise, people seem to be trying to avoid it. I think they don't like the implications of what Dr. Helen is saying here. What do you two think, Andy, Aaron? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I think for women it's an actually frightening future. And I, I know when I first, in fact, as Andy first talked to me about it, and I remember feeling quite bereft. Because as a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother, I have boys and grandsons and great-grandsons. And I don't want them to have to cut off from uh, relationships with women. Um, but I actually have to admit, once I sat down and stopped taking it, looking at it emotionally, it makes actual sense now, because the war against men has been going on since the 60s. We're coming to 50 years of terrible damage done to men and boys. And finally, and in a way I can say this, because I've been there for all those years, Men are actually beginning to say, no, we've had enough. We're not prepared to put up with this any longer. And for some men to actually take that step and really make themselves independent of women could be a huge growth factor, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. And I found a number of my friends have effectively gone the wrong way. And what I, what I sense is that men are individually going the wrong way, but they don't yet. Um, they don't have a collective... Um, identity at all, and I think um, I had a realization that MGTOW is actually going to be huge or has the potential to be huge in the future um, because there's just so many men out there who could potentially identify with this. Um, and I, I, I've always felt, you know, myself personally, I, I identify with MGTOW, MGTOWs and MGTOWism, and I also have sympathies on, on the other side where. Um, a lot of the relationships I've had in my own past have been very good ones and I recognize there's a lot of good women out there and I don't believe that anybody should be treated as if they're part of a homogenous group. You, know, you cannot say that all women are like this or all men are like this. And if anything, that has been the problem that men have always faced is that they've been accused of things or, or treated as if they're just all one big group of men and the feminists would pick up on a straw man or, or, or a bad incident or a violent incident. And, and men believe that all men are like that, and I think that's a, a terrible thing. Um, so I have sympathies quite across the spectrum, really, and uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I've looked at recently, and uh, I'm very interested in the changing relationships between men and women because I think this is going to be a major factor in the 21st century. I agree with you. What do you think? I think I think that um, men going their own way. There, there's three ways of look looking uh, at it. Uh, one is that it is a default position many men are finding themselves in without consciously saying it. They're just looking around. They're, as Dr. Helen says, um, uh, they're, they're looking rationally at the world around them and saying, why on earth would I put myself through this? Um, why? What, what's in it for me? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the butt of jokes. I'm going to have expectations laid on me and responsibilities, but rewards are smaller and risks are higher, and they're just opting out. Although, to me, it is a little sad in the sense that I, have, I know most men, if you look at surveys of young men in particular, they say they would like to have a girlfriend and a long-term relationship, yet they aren't doing it. And the number of men who say they want that is going down. Um, and so part of me says, well, it's good that they're recognizing the risks and the problems, 
although it's a little sad that the risks are there in the first place, or that the risks are so bad, um, it shouldn't have to be that way. But I view it as an honorable choice. Then you have MGTO as um, uh, then you have MGTO as a philosophy, and there there we have certain thinkers who are kind of well known in the men's movement. Um, uh, some of the bigger names known are Stardust, uh, Barbarossa, um, where we will occasionally see debates with them or disagreements with them. Although I think and hope what they understand is that these are debates, and, uh, you know, just discussions. Um, Lucien Valsan, who runs our Voice for Men Europe, will be taking uh, part in a debate recent, uh, uh, reasonably soon, and he actually wanted me to ask you a question, Aaron, because mm -hmm. um, it's going to be part, because he's going to be de debating with some of the more hardcore, I guess you'd call them mytho philosophers. Mm -hmm. One of the concepts that's very big in certain circles, I have my own skepticism about it, but I'm just going to read it out there. There's something very, very popular in some circles called Briffold's Law. What's that? Now, Briffold's Law was written by an, um, well, it's called Briffold's Law. It's a statement written by a, uh, uh, a social anthropologist. Um, he's also, well, he was trained as a surgeon. He was also a social anthropologist and even a novelist. Uh, late 19th, early 20th century thinker. Uh, Marxist, as it happens. Um, not uncommon in that era. He made the statement as a social anthropologist. I'm just going to read it verbatim. Um, it's from his book called The Mothers. And what he says is, the female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family. Where the female can derive no benefit from association with the male, no such association takes place. Now I'm going to read that again. The female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family. Where the female can derive no benefit from association with the male, no such association takes place. It's an interesting statement. What would your thoughts on that statement be? Well, I've always thought women see their role to civilize men. And I've always thought that men essentially encapsulate the exterior world, and particularly with the family and their children. They go out there for a very long time. It's changing now as more women are going out there. But I have found it quite chilling, actually, in all my experience with women, because they are almost born with a philosophy, which is possibly from their mothers and grandmothers, that the world owes them a man, a man who will protect them, keep them, take care of them, and protect them while they're having children. There isn't much in this thought, or, or what we were, we were trained to do as women, that says what we should be doing for men. In a sense, my generation of women, I'm 74, were brought up to be married as a profession. We were taught to cook, to sew, to knit, and to be at home in the family. And for many of us, we were quite content with this. That's why I was at odds with the women's movement in the beginning. And in return, our men could expect their home and their family and their nurturing and their care to come for us. All that, in a sense, is gone. There is a, a stalemate between men and women of total confusion. Miktal makes sense from the men's perspective. But what I'm looking at is from a woman's perspective, and I'm very aware that there is a huge, thousands and thousands, possibly millions of women in the Western world who have suddenly woken up to the fact that biology is their destiny. They have no partner, they have no child, children, and neither are they likely to. So all they have there to cling to in the 21st century is their so-called gilded careers. And as we know, only a very few women are able to have the kind of jobs that you want to give your, your, your life to. So I think we're in a state of huge confusion. Well, that, that to me points to one of the, the great falsehoods of the standing 
ideological feminist narrative, which is that men supposedly can go out there and find great fulfillment in these powerful careers. And you also have to wonder how silly some of these feminists, and now it's even gone into mainstream culture, is uh, fulfillment in life through career. Um, what percentage of men does that even describe? Uh, most guys I know are working stiffs who would do anything to have a better job that they're never going to get. I think um, that's right. And work is called work for a reason. They don't particularly like it. And they're not going to be corporate CEOs. I don't know how many men in the chat room listening to this show right now are going to be corporate CEOs or high-powered, high-paid attorneys. No, you're going to be a working stiff for the rest of your life. And so we've told women this is the path to happiness. No. But to get back to Griffo's Law, when I look at it, I see it in two points. Um, I see actually two completely independent statements there, each of which can at least be challenged or rendered questionable. Let's look at the first one. The female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family. To be blunt with you, I believe that statement is demonstrably false. What do you think? Well, I was, I was thinking a little bit earlier, Dean, that, that what you read out is, is quite a for a man to um, hear those words and have, have them expressed like that is quite a bit of realisation. Um, I'd be interested to, see, to hear what you're about to say about how it's demonstrably false. And I think many, many men will actually be able to identify um, with the reading that, that, that you gave. Um, and it's, I think it's also important, culture is changing. In the past, men's self-worth was based upon finding um, a woman and being married, and you mentioned uh, it was mentioned earlier that, that that now is changing. It's now acceptable for a man in his forties to be single. Um, so I think that that has huge cultural implications um, because men can be single and they don't have they don't necessarily have the same same need to um, you know to, to to look after and look after a woman in, in the way that was just described. Um, what I think is that that statement when I read it hit me like a fist and I saw a huge truth in it, especially as described in the modern world. I mean, I think there's no questioning that historically woman's role in the family has been a very, very powerful one. Um, I, I think that's true and that's the thing is that's my experience of my childhood. Uh, the, the woman controlled all aspects of it the whole life in the house. Um, well, certain decisions were, were, were left, left to my father. The internal workings of the house was left to me. And yet, the, the, where I start seeing problems with that, that first part of the statement around the edges is, I'm sorry, I've seen too many cases where a woman tries and fails to control the men in her life. I have seen cases where women try to uh, drive a man's friends or family out of his life or drive influences on him that she can't control out of his life and fail miserably at doing so. So when you phrase a statement like that as a law, which by the way, Briffold himself never declared it a law, other people did, I have problems with it. I think if you called it a generalization, that women are very powerful in determining the makeup of a family, uh, and that especially in the modern world with so many single mothers, it's even more true. But I am very uncomfortable calling it a law. What do you think, Aaron? I think you're right. I don't think it's necessary at all. But I think we have to go back to very, very basic things. I believe all human beings, men and women, want to love and be loved. People want to love and be loved. And we've lost that. We've lost the innocence of love because it has been driven to where, as far as the radical feminists are concerned, their original contention from the very beginning of all this is they, that they would destroy marriage. And as they grew more and more powerful and hold huge government positions, it has become more and more obvious that marriage is now... It, 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 it will probably die in the 21st century if, if we're not careful. I think I was talking to you this morning about the fact that here in England they're trying to get rid of the word husband. Husband? Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm terribly sad because I'm, I'm, I'm an old-fashioned romantic. And I think men and women complement each other. They make great partners. They make great friends and lovers. And they should be able to love their children freely. And I was happy to be a husband. I'm proud to be yeah, a wife. Well, yeah? You mean to have a husband? Yeah, happy, happy to have a husband. Yeah, sorry. Got that wrong. Yeah, and, it's, and I think it's an awful shame that all that goes because it's all come down now to threats and counter threats and huge sums of money being made to make sure that the war between men and women continues. And it is a war. Don't forget, it really is a war. And that's why MGTOW is going to be very, very powerful. Men are doing what men do very well. They're taking to the hills. Let's, let's look at the second part of the statement, and I'll, I'll also – we'll talk about it a little more. But it is, again, one where I see truth to it, but I wish to challenge it as a law. The second is where the female can derive no benefit from association with the male – no such association takes place. Um, but, but, Dean, isn't that a statement to the obvious? Um, yes. Why have an association with anybody if there was more benefit? Well, all right, the, we're debating it, right? But, okay, first off, is this not also true of males? Do males not opt? I, I mean, do we really wiggly dilly pigglity just take whatever woman makes herself available to us. I, I don't think that's normal male behavior. Do you? Um, I don't think so. Well, uh, if any woman approaches you, you're just going to accept that relationship. I, I, I don't think that that is true. I think where the statement seems to have its power, especially in some MGTOW thinkers, is that what we see over and over again in today's society is once a woman decides her man is no longer useful to her or meeting her needs, she'll just dump him. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I do. And knowing she can dump him, because these days she knows that she can take everything that she wants and keep the children and keep the property and then regulate what he does by giving himself him access to the children. But that's just, I would have to say, this is certainly not all women. It is, it is the women... Today, I can call, I call, they've lost their femininity. I think, I think the point is that culture and society condones, encourages, and enables women to behave like that. I mean, it should be no surprise that, that more and more women do behave like that, but that, you can't, you obviously can't say that's all women. I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything intrinsically bad in, in, in women, um, but I think, I think... I think there's something intrinsically bad in society. In society. Yeah. yeah. Um, um... Even though I am having big trouble phrasing this as a law, because a law to me is a, is a very, you know, that's like the law of thermodynamics or something, like it can't change. Well, but um, I think there may be something biological women, uh, like we have seen that, for example, it's found, been found cross-culturally that when men are depressed, women will have a tendency to hit them and challenge them and be disgusted by them. Um, and I, I think that's some sort of instinct that women expect on a very primitive level men to be taking care of them. And if they're not taking care of them, they find the man useless and it, it upsets them. Well, I think actually biologically it makes sense that they get upset because, you know, in, in the primitive brain, it remembers how dangerous and safe the world is. And, and for a, a one of the things that a woman has to, and both men and women have got to come to, to the understanding that essentially, yes, there have been huge changes. The feminist movement have done, they're the evil empire as far as I'm concerned, have done a massive amount of damage. But there are still the possibility of men and women loving each other in a whole healthy way and having their children. And hopefully, at some point, we will come back to that as a normal way of life. Now, most people feel that's abnormal. Yeah, I've seen in older generations of women and some younger, women who will stick in a marriage even though their man is horribly... He's going through severe depression. His mother with a three-year... She wing, she's, um, and 
of them kind of from the arrived from within the area. So, to you say, well, I think that's now. I'm
Hi there, everybody. Sorry for the sudden break. Apparently, we were having uh, big uh, connectivity issues. I hope you can all hear us okay. Aaron, you still there? Yep, I'm here. Andy? Yep, here. Okay. Uh, to try to get us on track, um, going back to the Brifols Law thing, I was saying that I have seen in my own life too many cases of women sticking by men when they no longer had any clear, uh, you know, obvious benefit from doing so, when it would have been in their, their own selfish interest to just say, screw that and kick him to the curb and not do so. So I think, and have you seen that too, Erin? Yes, I have. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. Uh, she's an American and her husband, and she's had the most appalling treatment for cancer. Uh, of the five people actually managed to, to survive the treatment, and she's the fifth. And all along, her husband has been her best friend, her lover, her husband, I said her husband. And to see somebody be able to go through all that the way they both have together, and the love that they have for each other, there's the 25th anniversary in a few days. That is something I think we can all as humans make laws and regulations and all the rest. The real love is one of the wonderful things that the universe gives us. And so therefore, I think we have to celebrate the fact that humans can love each other altruistically and for all their lives. Well, I can already hear the objection somebody's going to give, which is that you just gave an example of a man sticking by his woman when he had no obvious benefit. And then some guys have gotten to thinking, well, men will do that because men are inherently self-sacrificing, but women won't. No, I don't think. I think that's a dangerous thing of thought, actually, because, you know, men and women are human beings, and love is a human issue. And I just think that there are too many women in my life, anyway, who will stand by their men, whatever happens. And, and I, I don't want either side to write each other off. That's my one concern. I, I have seen, you know, there, there's this argument you'll hit, which is not all women are like that. They've acronymed it NAWALT, and they'll try to say, well, yes, but most really are. I don't buy it. I've seen too many exceptions. That said, I think we have a culture that whatever tendencies women have in that direction, we have a culture that greatly exacerbates it and even encourages it. Um, now, I understand we have a caller, Bill, on the line who'd like to talk a little bit about it. Uh, can we bring Bill on to give us his thoughts? Bill? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Hi, Bill. Hi, how's it Hi, going? Bill. So, hey, I'm doing uh, great. What was that, sorry? I said, we're doing great. What would you like to ask of our talk about, Bill? Well, I am a, a MGTOW, um, and I subscribe to Brifle Claw. And I, I heard what you guys were were talking about, and I really wanted to come on and and sort of clarify some things, at least from from my perspective. Um, first off, as far as the law goes, right, we're dealing with human beings, and w when you look at human behavior, there are no laws. You can't define it as this is the default way a human being is going to act. What is more appropriate to say is that people tend to do this sort of action. So not every woman is going to, uh, you know, break contact with a guy when she has no, no interest or she has no benefit from him, right? But that is the default type of action. And then we're completely not getting into things like, like uh, social constructs, like rational thinking. Um, these are just unconscious, irrational reactions to situations and we all have them um, like Aaron was saying she has friends who uh, stick by their man and that could be for any number of reasons like like social constructs we could have uh, religious pressures we could have family pressures that you know I've, I've seen some women stick with a guy even though she doesn't want to be because of the pressures that she's going to face from other people from negative uh, social pressures type of thing um, but as a general rule like you were saying it's more a general rule and when you're talking about human behavior it has to be generalized because you cannot cover what every person is going to do 
there's going to be some crazies out there who are going to do stuff you've never even thought of. And there are going to be other people who, who follow those general rules to a T. And I think one of the big problems right now, especially with modern feminism, is they've told women they can have everything. So these women expect it. And when they don't get it, it's no-fault divorce. It's easy to break up with a guy. Um, one of the problems, too, is because men have been demonized for so long, so many guys, and this was my case, too, we have incredibly low self-esteem. So when you said, you know, is the first girl that comes along the one that you're going to, you know, have a relationship with? Yes, absolutely. Because the guy is just feeling so lucky to get any attention whatsoever from a girl that, oh, my God, this is the one. And this is where the pickup community came in, where guys started studying the human behavior of, of women and themselves and started saying, you know what, I have choices. I have the ability to, to shape the life into what I want it to be, not just, you know, some woman has come up to me because I've spent my entire life being told what a pig I am, what a dog I am, how the only thing I think about is sex and I objectify women. And you start to feel bad about even having any sort of, you know, you're attracted to a woman. And you feel guilty about that. And then suddenly somebody comes along and says, no, you don't have to feel guilty about that. That's the way it should be. And you have the choice and you have the power. And I completely agree with Aaron in that, yes, love exists. But right now the system is so broken. It makes it so yeah. easy for people to to come in and just get rid of whatever they don't want, that they don't... When you get married, that's a vow. And mm. I don't want to get married, but I respect the hell out of marriage. My parents are still together after, like, 38 years. That's what I grew up with, with a, a stable family environment, and I don't see that anywhere in my generation. It, it gets a little bit hard after a year or two, and suddenly it's a divorce. So... Is um, this law a law? No. But as far as human behavior goes, yes, it is. Um, the the uh, women you're talking about... Something. Oh, sorry, can go ahead. Can I, just ask, can I just ask you something? Absolutely. How do you feel? How do you feel now that you've made a decision to be a MGTOW? I just wonder um, because... How, because if you seriously have decided to, to, to cut off from women... What is your future mm -hmm. in terms of relationships and children, your children? Oh, I, I don't want kids, and I, I definitely don't want to get married. One of the things is, is I'm from Canada, and I know what uh, the rules are like as far as kids go. And and it. They're the worst in the I world love. in Canada. Oh, was that sorry? I said they're the worst in the world in Canada. Yeah. I was there for a big tour, and I was they they basically steal children. Canadians should be ashamed of themselves for what they've done. Absolutely, you should. Be. I, I've, I've seen the, the, the worst things possible when it comes to Children's Aid Society, when it comes to divorce, how, how these women use the children as, as uh, bartering fodder for, for what they want from these men. And at one point in time, yes, I wanted it. As well. Your children's services are corrupt. Yes. Oh, it's, it's insane. Um, I have a, an aunt and uncle who adopted a, a girl, and her parents abused her. So the one day she was in school, and she said, my mommy and daddy locked me in the closet. Children's Aid was called. She was taken. She, she was never seen again. The, there was nothing they could do to get that girl back, and she was talking about her biological parents not her adoptive ones. They, they didn't ask questions, nothing, just gone. Yeah. And they had, they had been watching over this girl for like five years or something like that. She was a member of our family. And and I've seen, like, uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine, she has two sons, she's a, a single mother, and just on a whim, somebody called Children's Aid, and this lady came in and destroyed her life. And there were, her, her place was not the cleanest. It, it wasn't like, you know, rotten food or anything like that. She had two boys. They would run around the house tearing things up. So there were some clothes on the floor and stuff. 
And when, when we got into court, because I was helping her through it, uh, we saw the judge come out to talk to her lawyer, and I remember very clearly, he said, who's the caseworker? And they say the person's name, this woman, and the judge says, and I'm going to say what he said, he said, oh, shit, tell the mother I am so sorry. Because this woman had a history of, of lying and, and doing things she shouldn't, and because of the system, there's nothing you can do. They, there's no repercussions you can have on these people. Well, and so if, if I may observe then, you just observed a woman being screwed by the system, and I've known a few that that's happened to. And, and to bring it back to the, the Briffo's law business and why I think we need to be with at least some skepticism, even if we see some truth to it, I suspect – Anybody here can disagree with me. I suspect there's something instinctive in women that looks to men for protection and provision. I I do. And and so maybe a woman is more likely to view her man with some contempt or maybe at some instinctive level even wants to be rid of him if she decides he's no longer good for those things. Right, but but you're – there's there's the, the popular cultural idea of what a relationship should be like, and then there's our evolutionary past. And people think we're supposed to be these monogamous, lifelong partners. That is not the way we evolved at all. And if we ever hear the seven-year itch, it's actually a four-year itch. And one of the problems that I see with, with women when it comes to relationships is they you always hear women say, oh, there wasn't that spark. Well, what that is, that, that rush of emotions you, when you meet that special someone, is that is the mating ritual. That's chemicals being released into your brain to make you feel attraction for that person so that you mate with them and you have a baby. And you will wake up four years later in a marriage with a kid and married to some guy you never would have had you chosen more rationally the, the, the person you want. And you see that all over the place with single mothers and, and they're dating these, these guys that are in and out of prison all the time, and people wonder, why do you do that? Because that guy is displaying alpha male characteristics. And women, at the end of the day, we are the evolved social animals. And our biology wants us to continue on. This is why we get horny. It's why we want to have sex. It's because our bodies are trying to tell us, go make a baby right now. And a lot of well, people don't like to hear that because we want to hear that we're in control. But science is proving that we are not. Our brains make decisions for us three to five seconds before we're even conscious of it. And then it releases those feel-good emotions. It releases these, these urges. And then we go about doing it unless somebody is, has taken the time to become rational in, in those areas of their life and really study it. And that's why well, like, I think I think the, these questions will be extremely interesting in the 21st century. I think I think we, we're going to find out which which things are cultural and which things are biological. I think the way I, in there. I have a strong feeling that we've miseducated uh, generations of women and men um, to, to thinking things are a certain way and not being willing to look at the biological basis of things and. We told women they can have it all, and they can't. I mean, this is something even Aaron has observed. These women who are suddenly approaching 40, their biological clocks are going off, and they can't find a willing man. And, uh, well, why should they be surprised? Um, because nobody told them that that was the end result. They seem to forget that women after the age of 36 find getting pregnant difficult, that men can get pregnant in their 70s. Yes. Nobody told them that, and it was women who told women they could have everything. Men know that no one can have everything because they've never been in that position. So you yeah. got to work for it. Yesterday, yesterday, for all our arguments about nature, nurture, or whatever, we have higher brains, and that's what mm-hmm. makes us different animals, and we have the choice. And that, that is absolutely the case. There is a, a are, large part of us that is nature, and there is another larger part of us that is nurture, and it gets affected over time. But at the, ver- at the end of the day, we, like Aaron said, we all have higher rational thinking brains. But unless you're given this, this knowledge, you don't know. 
and then you get these these women that are having That's eight right. kids with 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 some random guy going why why can't I find a good guy? I, I don't hate women at all. I hate the the system that has been put in place, and I feel it is so unfair for guys. That's why I'm a MGTOW. But I consider myself like 80% MGTOW, 20% MRA. Because I, I understand that there has to be a fight for men's rights. Even if we eject ourselves from the system, eventually that system's just going to come after us. We, well, we can right. run away all we want and, until the government goes, okay, we're just going to tax all single guys. If you're single, then well, uh, we need you to have kids, so we're, we're going to double your taxes. That's and sort of and thing there has to be a fight for men's rights. That sort of thing may be in our future. We're going to have to move on, Bill. Thank you okay. so much for your call and for your input. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Please do call again. We've got a lot more stuff to cover, and we're already an hour in. Um, I'd like to get to the interview we, we did with Smith, which was um, two Sundays ago. What was it? Um, 20. Uh, have you? Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about our want to Hello, Smith speaking. Hello, Dr. Helen. This is Dean Esme and Aaron Pitsy calling. Hi. Thank you so much for calling today. Just thank you so much because it's so early for you. I'm delighted. It is. Oh, well, it's so nice of you to be able to take this. I am so sorry about my schedule. I, Saturdays are, are very difficult for me. But you're on a book tour, aren't you, at the moment? I am. I'm actually in New York City, yeah. And they've got me booked, like, every day with, like, sometimes even six shows a day. And, yeah. That I'm, is exhausting, actually. It, it is. I'm, I'm actually tired. But you guys are so great. I, I well, love you. your your show, and I'm so excited to talk to you and, and everything. So, um, and, Erin, I just love your work. I, I really you. Do appreciate it. Yes. Um, I would have so a big question I want to ask your help with. Sure. When, I, when I go to L.A. Uh, to visit my son and his family, my daughter-in-law has a lot of friends who are all in their probably 40s, early 40s. Uh -huh. Their problem in, in L.A. particularly, which I think you're going to be an expert to, to explain to me, men in L.A., heterosexual men, can do what they call date, but this means that they can actually sleep with the, all the women they date at the same time sort of thing. And this means that the girls, that, the women that come to talk to me are bereft because most of them don't want to end up with a sort of, you know, serial relationships with men who essentially don't ever and will never commit themselves. They're all doing well. And the girl, these women are facing the fact that, that they will probably never have children. And they're all in their 40s. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah, um, you know, that's a big problem in the coast. I've actually noticed that here in New York uh, is that the women are younger. I mean, hopefully they'll find someone, but um, we talk to a lot of women who are like 29 to 30, yeah. and they've got the same problem. So um, it's funny because in my book I talk about a woman there who is 40, and she said she hadn't gotten married, but she said that um, all the guys she meets want to want to get like a younger – they do want to get married. They just want to marry someone younger, so I think guys are waiting until they're 40 and then they're finding somebody maybe 29 or 30 to marry. Um, but that's another issue. I mean, I think that's a sort of almost a coastal thing, too, um, that people on the coast, I think the men who tend to go there tend to be more that way. That's what I find. I, I find I live in the south. I live in Tennessee. and I think oh, my little sister lives there. I know really? Tennessee. Well, yeah. Yeah, no, but it's much straighter in Tennessee, isn't it? It's much as worse. As I can see, there's a much uh, the family life is still fairly functional around my city. Yes, um, it, it is. But the thing is, is it's surprisingly that um, I actually read for the first time this year we have um, 
fewer there were fewer married couples in Tennessee in the state. So it's something like less. It's only 49 percent of the families now are, are married couples. It's mainly you know there's 50 percent single and and single moms or unmarried. Uh, so it is changing. Well, it's, it's actually frightening in many ways for us here. We have such a huge, we have more single parent mothers in England than anywhere in Europe. Wow. Well, yeah. Dean, you probably want to be taping some, uh, do you want to, do you want to get us started? Well, I or? suppose I should have told you, Helen. I, I, yeah, I started recording, uh, when I got to the front desk. So, oh. <laughs> we're already rolling. Also, oh, great. Right. anything if you're not comfortable, but we're already rolling. Oh, okay. Um, do you uh, all not enter? Do the show and uh... uh well since it's just pre-taped I'll when I do the show I'll say we had an interview on Sunday uh, with uh, Dr Helen Smith and, and here it is and then we'll oh, talk about okay. you and insult you and say horrible nasty things about you behind your back it'll, it'll be great that, you know what that is perfect I would enjoy hearing that at night it doesn't bother me nasty things hey, have, you had, have you had much of a problem with being criticized heavily by feminists for this book. You know, something people keep asking me that, and this is this is kind of unbelievable to me. But I kind of went into this book thinking that I would get attacked. Yeah. Believe it or not, I have not been. Um, I've had very very few things, and in fact, one of the things I found is that a lot of women seem to, to be interested in the book and to kind of sympathize. And 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 maybe it's the people I hang around with. Maybe they're more sympathetic, and maybe I'm traveling in an echo chamber, but. Um, a lot of the women have been very, very nice. The only thing I'm seeing is, um, I know somebody did, you know, some people will say, I hope she dies single or something, women I've seen, but it, it's very rare, and I've actually had a very good response from women, and they've been very, very nice. I don't really get any hate, much hate now, certainly not from feminists. They seem to overlook me. I, I don't know why they don't seem to bother me much. Maybe I'm either low, low profile or they just don't. They don't um, seem to come out to me. Mainly what I get in my mail, my email or anything else, are really letters, um, very heart-wrenching letters from men. And I know you have a lot of those on your, on, you know, with yeah. the work you all do. I see that all the time. And you know the stories, but that's what I get. Now what I'm getting from men now is, is thank you so much for somebody at least standing up. Yes. And one of the things that, you know, I guess one of the things that bothers me is I am a woman, and, and that's fine, and I think whoever needs to stand up should, but it would be great to see more men be able to stand up, but I think at the same time um, they get shouted down a lot more than a woman. What, what is your opinion on that? If I, if I could inject, I, I, I find that men are easily shamed. That seems to be a power. Women can, like uh, can shame men, and men take it to heart very quickly. We're used to thinking of men as uh, insensitive and thoughtless, and when in fact they're very emotional creatures, and they're very easy to shame into silence. And I think some of the more hateful feminists, it's special, know this instinctively or not. But we are seeing a lot more men willing to stand up. And I think the more of us who do stand up, as you're doing, the more men will stand up. I mean, uh, Aaron's raising a concern about all these single mothers. And Mm -hmm. I don't know what your opinion is, but I I, I think it's pretty obviously overwhelming that uh, children of single mothers while many of them do fine, the outcomes are enormously negative when you look at the whole social spectrum. I don't know if you would agree with that. Well, what we're seeing now, I mean, I'm not, in theory, I'm not really against single moms, but the problem is that what we see is when you see this, the studies where you see that 40% of women are breadwinners. I was on Lou Dobbs' show the other night, and one of the things he said, you know, he's on Fox News, and it's like he pointed out, these are not breadwinners. These are, a majority of these women are single mothers. I think it was something like, you know, of those 40%, a large majority of them were single moms making something between seventeen and $23,000. And a lot of those women are taking money and using the government as their da- their husband. And I think that's, that's where the problem is coming in is that all, the, you know, we're all subsidizing that. And at the same time, we're not allowed to judge that at all. People almost put single moms on a pedestal in our society. And, and I don't know, maybe Erin can speak to this in, in England. Um, but I, I can't, think that people... Sorry. One of our problems in England is that the state, really, has taken over the role of the father and, uh, and single-parent mothers. Essentially, most of the people I deal with have come from violent households, violent childhoods. They have no idea how to make a relationship. They have no model. 
and all they know is violence and, uh, and doing what they want to do, and they're taking no responsibility. This happens to both men and women. So the problem is, these numbers of children are growing up, children of violent families, and they're dangerous because they haven't been socialized. And I've been a single parent mother, and I know how incredibly difficult it is to, to bring up girls and boys without a father's safe arms. And one of the problems with bringing up a boy is that I am I'm a woman. I cannot father him like a man can father him. Fortunately, we had a big peer group of older boys for him. But my feeling is it is becoming an absolute disaster. Yeah, and I think that's wonderful. And I do tell people, and you know, as a psychologist in my practice, I think one of the things is that if people, like you say, if a boy has male role models in his life, besides the father, that, that can be helpful. I don't, truthfully, I don't know that it really takes the place of a father. I've worked in juvenile courts, and you do see, obviously, a lot of the boys there who commit crimes, especially violent crimes, are generally those kids without a dad. And, and you know, we know the studies show that women um, and girls become more promiscuous and have more sexual partners to get into more problems with, you know, unplanned pregnancies when they don't yeah. have a dad in the home. So, obviously, it's a, it's a very stabilizing force. Um, you know, at the same time, it's very difficult. And one of the things we were talking about earlier, what's really difficult is that women right now, really lovely women, cannot find a guy. I agree. And so I think a lot of, yeah, and, and it's what's happening in my book I talk about on Men on Strike is a lot of guys are just opting out because the rewards are so low and the punishments and, pe- you know, the the punishment and the, just the, the problems are so high if they do get involved with women uh, in marriage um, that a lot of guys I do think are opting out. I think we need to make a marriage a, a better place for men. And, you know, it, it begins with the legal issues and we and the, and the cultural issues. I mean, we, we look at young boys in schools. It starts there where we're telling boys that, you know, they're potentially rapists or they're perverts or they're, you know, I talked to a young man the other day and he's 14 years old and he said that he wanted to start a, a a boys or a men's, you know, boys group in his school, and they told him no, even though, you know, they have a girls group, and they've got the, the African-American group, they've got the Latino group, but he was not allowed to have that. He said all the teachers in the school were afraid to even allow him, even the male teachers were afraid to let him have a men's group. So we have a bunch of, of boys who are told in schools, you you are not allowed, you know, to, you're just, you're, even though sometimes they're the minority, they're told they're the majority, they're told they're the oppressors, and I think that they're taking in this sort of men are bad feeling, and I think it leads to uh, a lot of guys sort of opting out and realizing that, you know, their relations with women are becoming more strained. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you talk about this in your book, Men on Strike, uh, and, and, and some of the things you go into. I'm surprised you haven't gotten more controversy, because even though I actually agree with every word I've written in this book, read in this book, and I've read it all the way through, you're saying things that make people uncomfortable, like in My Body, My Choice, and Why Men Won't Marry. The real question comes in, I mean, you were just talking about, we were just talking about state subsidizing low-income mothers, which is one thing, but in another form of state subsidization we don't like talking about, but is true, is when the family courts are used to financially devastate a man. Exactly. And and um, possibly take away his children, and why would a man take that risk? I mean, that's a good question, and, and one of the things I was fascinated by was Politico had a story um, about my book, and one of the things that they found was a statistic that said that um, the, the government spent here in the U.S. spends 15, something like $15 billion to help collect child support, but they literally spent only about $10 million to help men get visitation rights for their kids. So you're right, there's a huge funneling of, of federal and state monies towards what usually are rights for women, whether that be, you know, child custody, um, the, uh, and child support. But at the same time, men aren't getting their rights and they aren't. So yeah, I think men are winning these rights. And, and look at it, even if there, people say, well, how many men are really doing this? Well, say it's about 8%. You know, when you look at the Pew Research Study, then you find that right now, men um, who, men who say that marriage is the most important thing in their life is somewhere around 29%. Women, there's something like 36% of women say that's the most important thing for me in my life. So you've got a discrepancy of 8 or 9% in the younger ages. But the staggering statistic is that for men who have never been married who are 30 to 50, 27% of those men are now saying, I don't ever want to get married. 
And we've only got 8% of women in that age group. So going back to your, to what Aaron was talking about at the beginning of the show, women who are 30 to 50, they want to get married. Those men in those age groups, 27% of those, that means almost a th- not, you know, coming towards a third of those men never want to get married. And that's a big discrepancy. And so, yeah, I think some of these incentives and what, what you're talking about, the risk that you would have to take, not only not only financially or legally, but in um, an emotional sense, because um, men do have a lot to lose out on because the culture does not support marriage for a man. Anything that he does, like you say, Dean, he's, he can easily be shamed. If a man cheats on a woman, it's fine to go after him with a, with a club and, you know, with a golf club like we see Tiger Woods. But if a, if a man, if a woman cheats, it's somehow the man's fault. And so there's so many ramifications where just psychologically men don't have, they just don't have a lot of rights in marriage. And, you know, you see a lot of, of men, of people and they'll say, well, not all women are like that. Don't worry about it. But we're not talking about what an individual woman will do. We're talking about what the society and the legal system are doing to incentivize in. mm-hmm. incentivize exactly. or disincentivize and I'm going to mostly let you and Aaron talk but I just want to make one more point for our listeners I know a lot of the people on A Voice for Men especially which is now the largest men's advocacy site on the internet and still growing but they'll, they'll be listening to some of that and you're saying you're damn right we're not getting married and we don't even feel sorry for these 40 something women who can't get married they mm-hmm. helped set up this system and they cheered it on screw them um, so well, I'm pretty it's, angry. Um, but go ahead. You guys go ahead and talk. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I do think that that's what they're saying, Aaron. I think that with these 40-something women, it's really not, in a, in a sense, you know, it's true that I think women don't really understand. Like, I talk to normal, everyday women in their 40s, and a lot of them, for example, one woman was telling me once about how her boyfriend didn't want to marry her. And then when I actually talked to her, she told me that, she goes, well, he doesn't want to get married because he has a lot. He has a lot of assets and things, and um, he has land, and he's got a lot of money. And um, she, this woman didn't understand. She goes, well, I guess he's just um, greedy. And I'm like, what? I said, well, she was. She thought that he was being greedy because he didn't want to hand over all his stuff to her. And it's almost like I think men, women have this feeling, even just normal everyday women, that whatever is a man's is. is it's hers, and whatever is hers, it's hers. And I just think that um, men are sort of getting more savvy to this way of thinking that the average woman has. Does that resonate with you, or do you, do you find... Yes, it does. It does. It's, it's this sense of entitlement. I'm absolutely shocked by an awful lot of women. Women who turn around and say to me that they're unhappily married, um, but they then say, of course, I'm a feminist, so I don't do cooking, and I don't do housework. And I just say, well, what do you do? And the answer is, well, it's not really my problem, it's his problem. I remember one woman saying to me, but he knew I was that sort of girl when I was when, I, when he married me. Um, because he was now busy trying to get unmarried, and she was absolutely shattered. Uh, we have the other problem for a man, is I, I think, is that when, the moment he is in a relationship with a woman, not even married, just living with her, after a couple of years, uh, that now uh, our feminist ministers are bringing in a law to give a woman equal rights with marriage when a man comes in to live with yes, her. Yes, and that's what I'm worried about is the, exactly the common law marriage. And yeah, I, I that's wonder, right. She I wonder now, what's going to happen, yeah. Well, I just think less and less men are going to risk anything. They'll go to the whole idea in L.A. where men can have it all. They can date women, they can sleep with women, and the women I'm dealing with are absolutely wretched because they know there's only a few more years, and then they're going to not be able to conceive a child. And then none of them have an income enough to be able to do it on their own because your provision for a single parent mother is nothing like as good as ours is. I mean, a woman, if she has a child uh, without a man around, she will have her own accommodation paid for, a council tax paid for, and a sum of money every week. But then we'll try to shame a man for not wanting to have that, for, for, for wanting to have sex but not commit. But, what again, what... It's almost like, does he owe anybody commitment in a relationship where he has no guarantees of anything? I don't think a man owes anybody anything, and I don't understand. I mean, I I can understand where men are sort of coming from. At the same time, what people turn around and ask me is they say, well, it's really because women are allowing, like, men can just get sex. And it really bothers me when people just say, well, men are just really looking for sex, and that because they can have that, that's why they don't commit, because that's, 
I don't really think that's true. What most of the young men in my book told me was that the fact that women have sex with a lot of guys makes them they it makes them more wary and the reason is because they don't have any rights and because it's such a big risk to get married if they see a woman that does sleep around on them it's it's a it's such a warning sign of because he knows that after that marriage if she did something like that he has no rights at all and and of course the moment he's in a relationship he loses all his his rights for the for the first and the most vital right if she claims he's hit her the police will pull him out and he is then guilty. He loses the right to be innocent until he's proved guilty. From the moment he moves into a relationship, and once he's out of that house, it's up to him to prove that he is innocent. And he can't do that, particularly if he's been accused of molesting children, where there's a lot of that, of that from women. Yeah, because they know that once he's accused of molesting the children, he can't come back. He can't see his children. He goes out of her life, and then for the rest of his life, he's chased for child maintenance. It's not a happy picture for men and women these days. It really isn't. Well, what do you think? I mean, what do you think, Erin, that women can do? People ask me that. And I I mean, I, I do think one of the things is that we need to look through, just as we did with the feminists earlier, and look through the discriminatory laws here in the United States, starting and, and going through and finding how are they discriminated against men and how do we change them. I doubt that's ever, you know, that's going to happen unless there's a lot of us who stand up and say, you know what, we're not going to take this anymore. I think the thing is to, to start on a, on a small, you know, in small baby steps. One of the things I see here that's appalling is the due process rights that have been taken away from men in the colleges here. Yeah. There's a letter that, yeah, I, and I'm sure you know about that and maybe, yeah. maybe you've all discussed it, but I, I don't know why people don't address that. I don't, I don't know why somebody's not standing up for the colleges and saying, you know, this is ridiculous. I mean, that a man, there are no, you know, they only need 50% evidence to charge a man with a sexual assault or some type of sexual harassment against a, a woman in college and that he can be thrown out. If a, mm -hmm. if a campus tribunal just thinks that he did it, there doesn't have to be any proof. Again, he's got, he's got no rights. Right. Uh, but I don't understand why people aren't standing up to this. I think it's just not, honestly, I just think it's not something most men think about. And, and nobody talks about it. We don't have any education classes except to let these people listen to a voice for men. But, other than but, my, that, but my problem, honestly, Dr. Helen, is that, for instance, I have a young girl that I took to university in the north of England, very brilliant young girl. I picked her up a year later. She was spouting all the way down, radical feminist, and her hatred of men. You see, they're brainwashed once they're in universities, the girls, because so many of the tutors are radical feminists. And so all across the country, this dislike of men, and I have to sometimes just stop a woman saying something. Have you, have you heard what you just said? You Underneath it all, you don't like men. And then she'll protest. But the fact is, for the last 40 years, what have we heard about men? Well, from the very beginning, I remember standing on in this big platform in women's meetings and them saying, marriage is a dangerous place for women and children. And our minister at the time for women said, the new model will be women and children, men unfortunately can't be trusted. So for all this 40 years, there has been this miasma of hatred and shame and anger against men. I think we have to start, as you said, with baby steps and just personally stop any woman who is denigrating a man and say, why? Why do you feel you can do this? You know, I do that, and people really look at me, or they pretend like it's not really happening. And I actually, yeah. maybe I've become too emotional, because a lot of times when I see women... You know, even a family member who says something, um, I get very, you know, I will say, why are you doing that? Or, you know, yeah. people just, they don't understand. They don't, if something happens to a woman, it's it's horrible. Like if she's yeah. hurt in some way, whereas if it happens to a man, it's just not, they just don't see it as important. It's actually funny, you know, for yeah. a man to be beaten or harmed. And, and it's so ingrained. And I think you're right. I think if we stop and... And that's the thing that I'm seeing with my book is there are women out there, and I don't know what percentage of them, and maybe it's... But there are women who, I don't know if they're willing to stand up, but they're definitely willing to listen, and they are starting to see what is happening. And I, and I, they don't like it, but the thing is, just because you don't like something, I think, you know, we have to change the tide. And I, I think that's a good point. It's just in our interpersonal relationships. That's one of the points I make in the book for women. Uh, my book is for men, but I have a little section in the book for women. And, and one of the things it says is, you know, 
if you see your girlfriends bad mouthing men and you're going, you're out with them and they're bad mouthing men, you know, put a stop to it. Don't speak up and say, you know, you don't appreciate it. And honestly, um, I think women they tend to sort of be herd animals. They all want everybody to be on the same page. And I think women are so desperate in some sense to be liked, mostly by other women, that they, they, they will just put up with the most, uh, you know, obnoxious behavior. Um, and it's kind of a bonding experience where women get together, and I guess they – you even see it on the talk shows where they just don't seem to think anything of just saying anything negative about a man. And they all kind of get together, and then they all wonder why, if they're 40, no man wants them. Yeah. Um, you know, and – I mean, I don't think it's just their fault. I do think part of it, too, though, is that I do think that men, um, I mean, I think one of the things is that women are waiting longer and longer to get married because of their careers and things. And I do think it seems that men now want to get married around 40, and they do want somebody who's a lot younger, maybe. I mean, that's another That's always been the case, hasn't it? I mean, I remember, see, I come 74, so I come from a time when relationships between men and women were intensely romantic. I mean, all that got poo-pooed by the radical feminists. But no man or boy could take you out unless he had your parents' permission. And he had uh, rules about what he could do and couldn't do. And in my time, men didn't risk having sex with women because they knew if she got pregnant, they'd have to get married. And the families knew each other. And now I just feel women are very unprotected, and especially this whole business of having... Uh, a, uh, um, a career and then the child because no one's been honest about the fact that you are far more likely to have damaged children if you wait too long. And women right. very and often... Something that, yeah, people are, are talking about that here in the U.S. I mean, there is some talk of, you know, letting women know they do need to be, you know, younger when they have kids. However, um, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, they do, and I, I but people don't... I think they don't like it that much, but I have noticed there is a change of, of women. And the thing is, women, I think that's one reason women, um, younger women more and more um, do say that marriage is an important thing in their lives. But the problem is the men don't feel the same way, so it's just a lot harder to find a partner um, when when you're younger. I think um, that uh, I think that men uh, need to do something here, too, because men are very quick to throw their fellow men under the bus. It's like yeah. a woman's pain is a call to action, and a man's pain is a call for mocking. And men have that attitude, too, and we need to stop that and stop trying to impress women with how quick we are to denigrate our fellow men, because men go along with this. And they, 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 as, as We even have people like, I, I don't hate William Bennett, for example, but he and some conservatives like Kay Heimowitz, have been addressing, have addressed the crisis, growing crisis of men in family life, in education, in the workplace, and their answer is to call these men losers mm -hmm. instead of saying, what's wrong with how our society is treating men and what are we doing to address their needs, their concern, and yes, their pain? It's like people don't want to hear it. No, you're right, and I've I've actually posted about some of these things. You know, Bill Bennett, and then Kay Hanna with his book Manning Up um, discusses men as sort of man child, and she really got the the part about the anger, and she seemed to understand that there was a problem, but the problem was, like you say, when you tell people to man up, that they're, they're child men in a promised land, which was one of her chapters. You're not doing any men any service. Um, what was interesting is um, I noticed Tucker Carlson, who was on, was on hosting Fox and Friends. They actually um, did a show yesterday on my book. I wasn't there, but I noticed that Tucker Carlson was saying men need to man up and take responsibility and get married, and that was the problem, that they didn't seem to get the thesis of my book at all. I guess they hadn't even read it. But I, I just was appalled that, that that is that is the opinion of a lot of men. Like you say, they denigrate their fellow men instead of standing up and saying, you know what, there are a lot of problems in our society with how men are being treated. We need to look at what's behind it. Um, they stand up and they say, okay, men aren't getting married. There's something, you know, they need to man up and start taking responsibility. Well, who the heck's going to take responsibility for something when there there is no, like people say, well, you know, a man needs to get married and just be good to his kids. Well, how, how can he be good to your kids if a wife turns the kids against you and the courts help them along and assist them? It's very difficult because you're right. I think that men are very sensitive and to feel that you're, that that the caring and the love that you have is not going to help you to, you know, to keep your kids or the courts may take your child from you. I mean, it's a, 
it, it's really a terrible thing. And to know that basically the woman, the child almost, um, I talk in the book about coverture, and that's in the 19th and 20th century, where coverture is where the old English law and American law, where the, the rights of the marriage were assumed by the man. He held the card and the rights of the marriage in his hand. Um, today, women help hold the cars, and they hold the coverage in their hand. And, um, you know, because of that, it makes it a lot harder for men to want to engage in, in this, you know. But in a way, why would he when he knows that the result of even the slightest quarrel can be this, the, the denigrated and be told that he's a woman basher? Because even if he raises his voice now, that is domestic violence. I've been arguing about this for ages. So the man knows when he gets married. Whatever happens, he's one phone call away from losing everything. No. And it's even, it's even interesting that you mentioned the old coverture laws. Some of those are still in effect, and what's little known about those coverture laws is they contain protections for women, as well as giving certain rights to men. A lot yeah. of coverture laws are still active. They just stripped out the parts that were disadvantageous to women, but left yeah. in the parts that were disadvantageous to men. Like, for example, here in the state of Michigan where I live mm-hmm. um, if there is a if there is jointly owned, if there is a, 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 a marriage and property is owned a woman may sell the property without telling her husband but a man may not sell a property without telling and getting the consent of his wife it's a little bit of obscure trivia but it's because the parts that were discriminatory against women at all are gone but the parts that were discriminatory about men are still there wow Unbelievable. And, you know, I think you all had it up on your site, but I know I've read before that, and I think Warren Farrell talked about this, but one of the things is that even the old coverture laws, one of the reasons people don't don't realize that men actually didn't have it so good, you know, at the turn of the century. What was happening is if a woman acted out in some way or did something that was illegal, the man was put on trial. The man was held responsible for what a woman did, and he could be jailed for that. So when people talk about, well, man was, you know, men were hitting women back then, well, yes, it was horrible, but at the same time, if you're being held responsible for her behavior, which it's a terrible system, but on the other hand, if she did something that was, you know, against the authorities or, or that, that the government didn't like, then you yourself, the man, could be placed in jail. So it wasn't like men were going around having this fantastic time and women were all being, you know, horribly discriminated against. There were also discriminations against men, particularly those men who are just, you know, average men without any political power. And I think a lot of times, um, what I find interesting is just that the average man is sort of what we're talking about in our society. I think higher level men, part of it is I've talked to higher level men and a lot of them say that feminism has been great for them because basically all the women want a higher level man, a man who's educated, makes a lot of money. Those guys can really sleep around. But what they don't realize, except for some of them, is that Yes, you can do that, but you're still kind of, you're, you're still, the courts are not going to be in your favor if something happens. If you're charged, for example, you see all the, you know, the, the NBA players and those kind of guys. If you're charged with a, with a rape or a sex abuse, I mean, you're still held to a high standard, even more so maybe if you're wealthy or if you're high, high, um, status. Well, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that surveys have been done on this and most men, when asked, say they would like a long-term steady relationship with a girl or woman, and they would like those things, yet they're not doing it. And, you know, answer one is, well, they're, they're immature boy, you know, boy men who won't man up. But the other is, why the hell would you put yourself through that? And I say that as a married man, okay, uh, and a father. But I, I, I look at what my son's got going ahead of him, and I go, I'm afraid for him. I think a lot of men are, are, and women are, are afraid for their for their boys because they know when you have a boy, you really know that, you know, he's he's at a disadvantage in a lot of ways in the school systems, in the colleges, in in the, you know, just in the the legal realm of of uh, marriage and relationships, and it's, you know, it, I think that the fact that mothers have sons, maybe that might be some driving force, but it's too bad that women can't just stand up even though they don't have a son, you know. I think women are very frightened. A lot of women will say to me uh, under their breath, you know, Erin, I'm not really a feminist. As though if you're not a feminist, somehow you're not a real woman. Because so much has been uh, the, it's absolutely brainwashed into this great religion, really. And, and it's an angry religion. And so many women say to me, you know, I'm a woman with attitude. 
And I said, this is very tiring. Could you kindly not have an attitude? Could you just be nice, a nice woman who is feminine and likes everybody? But there is this whole movement, isn't there, of, of women who reach for male power. And in reaching for male power, it brings out the worst in them, as far as I'm concerned. Sorry, that's my PC breath going down. I'm going to have to leave you because I'm going oh, off yeah. to an appointment. But I'd love okay. talking to Dr. Helen. Thank you, Erin. It was so lovely talking to you, and I, I look forward Don't to reading more about yeah. your work. I, 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 I'm sure you have other things to do, too, Helen, but I'm hoping yes. that when things settle down a little more for you, maybe we can have you on the show live and take a few calls okay. sometime. Let us know. Hopefully the book is, book is doing well. Uh, it, it is a is, hell of a book. Yes. It is a hell of a book. I plan on writing, and I still haven't written my review, but it's going to be a hell of a review. I look forward to that. Thank you. All right, Helen. Well, I'm, thank you for getting up early on a Sunday morning when I'm sure you're exhausted. And uh, No problem. We'll talk again soon, okay? All right, Dean. Thank you. Have a great day. I'll say hi, I'll say hi to Glenn. I will. Have a great day. Bye, Aaron. Hello, everybody. I apologize for the technical glitches we appear to be having on today's show. Um, this is the first show we've done um, where we've had this happen to us on this show, but it does happen with Blog Talk Radio sometimes. Uh, Andy and Aaron, are you still here with me? Yes, indeed. We're still here, Dean. Okay. Sorry about the interruption. Um, uh, that was a good interview. We did that about two weeks ago with Helen Smith. She's on book tour and really hard to get a hold of, but we, we uh, hope to have her live on the show to take questions at some point in the future. We just have to get the, a commitment out of her. She indicated a willingness, but we got to find a way to fit it into everybody's schedule. In the meantime, it is a very, very good book. I recommend it to everybody. Um, uh, now we're all a little. I'm a, I'm a little off kilter myself. Andy, you, you had something you wanted to read or share with us. Exactly, Dean. I've got a. I've got an article that I've been working on about how men go in their own way and the. The, the changes that would bring for society. And one of the aspects that I wanted to discuss, uh, um, I think there's, there's two kinds of men going the wrong way. I think you've got adult men who are making uh, a decision later in life. They're making an individual decision, but they're making it uh, with some degree of consciousness. But you've also got um, young, young, the younger generations who have been brought up with the negativity that's been directed towards them. And I think, you know, and, and I, in the future, I would like to explore what their perception of the world is and how it affects them. Um, so to start with, I've, I've, I've wrote an article to explore this, and I've written this for the mainstream. You know, it's not, it's not an article that, that's directed within the men's movement itself. Um, so I thought perhaps maybe if I broke it up into two sections and we could break and dis discuss after, after halfway through. Um, does that sound like a good plan? Yeah, but... Um before we do that, um, and it's probably going to make the show a little long today, but that's all right. Uh, I did get a question came into chat from uh, Stardust, who is one of the most noted of the MGTOW philosophers, although he and I have uh, jostled back and forth uh, disagreeing over some things, although I think we're 90% in agreement, 95%. Um, so, but in any case, he, he's always a thoughtful thinker and uh, always a, has things to say. And he had, he had a question for you, Aaron, that he typed out for me. Okay. Uh, he says he wants to put you on the spot. Okay. In your discussion with Dr. Helen, you made the statement, women are not protected. What did you mean by that? They have not the protection that they had. Talking to somebody who was a teenager in the 50s and married in the 60s, when men still were very much our protectors and it was accepted that when you got married and you had your children, the role of husband was still very clearly defined. And I was married and I ran the house and looked after the children and I also made sure that when he came home that everything was ready for him to come home and that he would have a three-course meal and he would say goodnight to the children and bath them if they were there. But he was my protector, and my friends had, had the same issues. Uh, and what the women's movement said is that, the, that men had to be refused, that the, the chivalrous gene in a man that would 
would let you get on the bus first. They would open doors for you. They would carry heavy things for you. Would change car tires with a condescension and oppression. And I remember thinking that I liked men who carry heavy things for me and, and opening doors for me and helping me. They're a role as protector. I was the mother protector in the way that women can protect men and, men and men's feelings. And my husband was my protector. And I, when I heard all this business of how women didn't need protection, and I thought, well, when you're eight months pregnant, believe me, you need protection. It's jolly lucky if you walk down the road without hanging on to somebody. And I just thought, this is going to be disastrous because women are very, very vulnerable when they're pregnant. And it's a long time afterwards when they're looking after these tiny creatures that have to take so much time and effort. And that's the time when the man is there to help you and to be your help meet, which is what marriage is about. That's what I meant. Right, and now you have women... I mean, well, uh, we talk about... Protected. There are now thousands and millions and millions of women who are single parents living in England on massive estates. There's no fathers, no men on those estates. And if a woman brings a man onto this state, the trouble is that he tends to get thrown out when she's bored with him, and then he moves in with some more men, women, and he leaves a load of pregnant women behind. It is actually getting quite primitive and bestial. Yeah, I mean, okay, so in other words, what you'd say is that both the emotional as well as the financial and physical protection that marriage provides is something women no longer have. Well, women threw it away. That was my argument with them. Um, and now seem to depend on the state or the family court system, but a lot of them wind the up being... Father now, the father now in the Western world is the state. Yeah, and is and doing a good a job. Women, women's ministers in other countries as well as England, particularly England, have said in policy documents that the new unit of the 21st century will be women and children. Men are not necessarily harmonious to marriage, is the way they put it. This doesn't arguably is a detriment to women uh, almost as much as men, although I think men have got the shorter end of it. I think James wanted to say something. James? Yes. Um, it, when, we, when we take a look at this, uh, some of the arguments that, that, we're, that we're bringing up, we've, we've got to admit that um, while – we agree that a lot of the issues uh, are are with the state, you know, the state's laws. Uh, there's going to be a point in time where technology is mitigating a lot of the factors that marriage used to cover, uh, as far as uh, resource gathering, um, physical protection. Uh, even something as simple as heavy lifting. So, I mean, we've got, and I don't see us being able to ever put that genie back into the bottle again. I don't think it's but going James, to happen. James, can I ask you something? James, don't you think at the end of the day, for all the talking and everything that could be done technically, human beings need to put their arms around each other? And know that they're safe. Oh no, and no, no! I, I'm not. I'm not safe. saying that there's. I'm. I'm certainly not saying that there's not love, and I'm certainly not saying that I wouldn't like to see loving relationships uh, between men and women. Uh, what I what I am saying is that that marriage as an institution, uh, supported through state sanctioning, is going to go the way of the dodo in the long run. Uh, we we may turn we may turn to each other and turn to our communities for the type of emotional support uh, that human beings seem to need naturally. However, I think that um, that the combination of uh, bringing the genie out of the bottle in the first place, with the uh, social attitudes that we've taken on ourselves over the last 60 years, combined with technology's mitigation of natural consequences is never going to allow us to be able to go back to the way things were. Well, and so maybe what we need is a new social contract or a new idea between men and women. 
because children desperately need their fathers, and I think anybody's in denial about that is probably abusing their children. But I'm not sure we can get back to the old arrangement. I, I think, James, you have a really good point with that. I don't know what the... you, but it's been the default arrangement more than thousands of years now. So but before we say goodbye to it, let's just wait and see. I have great hopes that a generation will come together and look at each other and put everything that's gone wrong right. I, I think we can get to the point where we can... Uh, I, I think eventually it, it'll be forced upon society to get to the point where we will eventually have individuals choose to remain in intact families. But I think that the time of state-sanctioned marriage is over. I think that if couples are going to choose to uh, to to remain then the state is going to have to remove itself from that business entirely in order to ensure its own survival. The only way the state will survive is, is with the continued existence of intact families. That is one of the reasons why they are so keen on enforcing uh, common law marriages and things of that nature, because they, they know that the resources and the population increase uh, will eventually allow them uh, greater and greater control. Uh, as MGTOW begin to remove those resources and the natural population reduction as a result of the, uh, uh, of the removal of not, not just their financial but also their, their, their physical and mental resources, uh, we're going to see the collapse of countries. We're going to see economies fail. This Partly will eventually also, James, this, this will eventually happen. Europe, but, but James, one of the biggest things that's happening now is that as families are having fewer and fewer children in countries like particularly, let's say, China that's had the one child policy, they're gonna collapse because there's nobody there to look after the, the pensioners and the old age people. Yes, absolutely. And they more and more the, the, yeah, the weight the, goes on to the state. The, exactly. It, and, and the state, as a result, will, will end up crushing itself underneath its own weight. At, at, yeah. which point, at which point, individuals who are able to actually take a look at objective reality may decide to begin to invest long-term and intact families once again. But I think by that time, because we have such a large amount of technological mitigation available to us, we may have learned our lesson, and that genie of state-sanctioned marriage will never be able uh, to, to operate in the same way. It, All right, it, so you're saying well, state sanctioned. You're saying state sanctioned, but the default of marriage it doesn't need state sanction. It needs two people who are committed to each other and realize they're both invested in something. That's that's um, that's something on that's something on a spiritual level. What I'm talking about is something on a legal level. Uh what what two individuals uh decide to do, that's that's entirely up to them. I, I would invite I would invite the legalities to leave the hall of what these two individuals decide to do uh, and and allow them to to raise children in a, a happy environment but as long right. but as long as as long as we continue to subsidize bad behavior through the state sanctioning of marriage, through the forceful redistribution of wealth from the backs of some people onto other people, we are going to see the economies of, of Western societies collapse as a result. Well, I guess we'll see what we see. I think Aaron and I are probably at least in agreement one thing that's badly desired is a reparation, uh, some kind of reparation of this horrible 
wound between men and women. We're running low on time, and I, uh, um, we're almost at two. We're an hour and 45 minutes. We usually try to cut at two hours. That's okay. We can run a little longer. Andy, maybe you'd like to read one part of your essay for us, and we could discuss it. I'm sorry the technical troubles uh, shortened our time options, but would you like to read part of your essay to us? Well, why don't I just start and we'll see where we go, Dean. Okay. Um, so the title of this is, Why Are Men Going Their Own Way When It Comes to Relationships? Everywhere, men are stepping back when it comes to romantic commitments. Many young men are simply indifferent to the idea. Some are afraid, while others are angry and have this bitter message for the opposite sex. We don't know you, we don't need you, and we don't want you. In 1970, more than 94% of women in the UK were either married or had been married by the time they were 40 years old. Since then, marriage rates have plummeted, and over all age groups, married couples are now in a minority. The decline of marriage is a popular topic of discussion in the media, with many commentators putting it down to changing lifestyles and freedoms for women. Indeed, there is a general consensus that young women are putting careers ahead of relationships, and as a result, the number of marriages taking place per year has almost halved over recent decades. For much of the last 40 years or so, it is undeniably true that women have been postponing both marriage and childbirth. I would argue, however, that there is now a new phenomenon taking place, one that is a harbinger of radical change for the relationship between men and women. In the years to come, it will be men, not women, who will be the ones driving down marriage and birth rates. Men are beginning to recognise their appalling vulnerability when it comes to dealing with the opposite sex, and they are individually waking up to the ridiculous risks they face. Almost 70% of divorces are now initiated by women, and typically to the man who stands to lose everything, his children, his home, his future income, and his reputation. With suicide being the biggest killer of young men in the UK, and with those experiencing relationship breakdown being at the highest risk, he also stands to lose his life. In response, many men are now avoiding long-term commitments or are simply turning their backs on relationships with women altogether. Recent national crime surveys show that men account for 40% of those who suffer domestic abuse. Many believe the true figure to be higher because men underreport the abuse against them. Male victims know that they face not just ridicule, but the risk of being falsely labelled as the perpetrator by both police and female support agencies. Young men especially have internalised the appalling message that whenever two drunken people have sex, one of them is a rapist. American psychologist Dr Helen Smith agrees and argues that men in the West are both consciously and unconsciously going on strike. In her recent book, Men on, men on Strike, she describes how young men have internalised society's negativity towards them and they are not only avoiding, avoiding marriage and fatherhood, but are also dropping out of higher education and leaving the workforce at astonishing rates. Where married men and father figures were once viewed with respect, they are now presented as buffoons in the media, and new generations of males are simply refusing to relate to such negative stereotyping. As a result, young men are rejecting traditional gender roles, giving rise to the metrosexual male. Urban heterosexual men who prioritise themselves and their lifestyles above other, other commitments such men are decidedly single. Now, if we want a glimpse of what the future may hold, we only need to look to Japan, where those who reject their traditional masculine role are referred to as grass eaters, or herbivore men. These men are not just decidedly single, but they show little, in, little or no interest in sexual relations. With a staggering 70% of young Japanese men identifying themselves in this way, 
they have become a cultural and economic phenomenon, not to mention a major target for advertisers. They are also considered a significant factor in the plummeting Japanese birth rate and are blamed for many a single woman's solitude. Well, there's a very exciting piece of information. Now, I'm, I'm, in, I'm fascinated by that because I have no idea if it's 70 percent. I was staggered. Yes. I, I assumed it would be much lower, but that, that's, that's what That's the latest figure. That's on Wikipedia, and, and that's, that's sourced from a, an independent source. What do yes. you think, Dean? Well, yes, we've talked about this a lot on A Voice for Men. It seems to a certain extent a lot of this uh, has, has started in places like Japan before even here. Young men look at the crushing responsibility that their fathers and grandfathers had and expected of them and are just playing, saying, why should I? And... And, and this gets to, I mean, so far as I know, ideological feminism uh, never took great root in Japanese culture. Um, maybe it did. I don't know enough, but I do know that just a staggering number of young men are looking at the entire thing and saying, why the hell should I bother with any of this? I do know that, that, that the divorce laws and, and all that uh, still run hard against men in Japan. Um, and it is. It's a huge thing. A very large number of young men are just refusing. And, well, and, and one, of the thing, one of the things that's not working, which is what conservatives here try to do in the United States, is to make them ashamed of it. And that doesn't work. At some point, does somebody figure out that making them feel ashamed of themselves is not a good motivator? I think it's much more fundamental, Dean, especially with the newer generations. They're, they're, they're watching television. They're... they're, they're, they're um, experience in media and films, have they not seen any positive role models and they've got nothing to identify with. And it's an unconscious thing. It's, it's, just, it's just not something that they can relate to and that they're looking to find a, a place in society that, that they can exist comfortably and, and they're finding a new one. And I think that, that has major impacts for, for relationships between men and women in the future because men are not in the future are not going to be this, this, this provider, this, this this, this role that, that they've traditionally had, it's just not going to be there. there, there there's no new generations don't identify with that. And I think that's not surprising, really. I, I think that one of the things, and, and that one of the things we're going to see, and this is a conversation women are going to have to have with each other, as well. But but men are going to somewhat have to force them to take, have it. Um, is men have to be encouraged to say, oh, really, you want me to sit down and settle down and commit and make children with you? Well, actually, I might like to be father, but a father, but uh, what's in it for me, cupcake? Exactly. And, 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 and that and, sounds and, totally unromantic and almost cruel, but why? Well, why why that, shouldn't that, a man just ask that question that bluntly? What's in it for me? I think men need to find that they're comfortable to ask those questions. They've never had that, that permission before. They would have always felt afraid to be able to ask outright questions in, 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 you know, in whatever context. And, um, but I think that's changing. I think that will change. And I think men individually are waking up. Um, but I think they've yet to realize that they're not alone in their realizations. I can almost hear Aaron squirming. I mean, it sounds terribly unromantic to think that a woman would have to approach a man that way, doesn't it? Or does it? From my point of view, I think, why I welcome this discussion is I think it's been too long coming. And I think for far too long, men have simply either tried to laugh it off or hide and not face the inevitability of what I call the evil empire, which is the radical feminist. So from the very beginning said that the ideal relationship, I keep saying this, would be women and children and men will be dispensable. And men have suddenly heard what they said. Mm. And men are making themselves dispensable and getting out of the way. And I can only tell you of the droves of women, particularly when I'm in L.A., which I go regularly because my son's there, and talk to the, the, the women in their late 30s, the biological clicks, the click, uh, clocks ticking, and they're facing the fact they will not be married, they will not have children, and they have not become famous and rich as they were promised that they could have everything 
They're bitter and they're disillusioned. And all I can say when I look at them is, why did you believe the lie? And the other question is, which I'm interested in, why did men take so long to take the radical feminist movement seriously? That one, I don't know. We might have to devote a whole show to that last question. But the, the, but it did take men a long time. Um, I will say one thing. I think part of it may have been cultural, part of it may have been biological, but I believe at a very deep level men instinctively love women. We almost can't help it. I, and, I think and, so. Maybe it's the case that men have, all, have almost patronized women in the past or all. Three older yeah. generations were patronizing towards women and, and did not take them seriously when they should have done. I think that's part of it. And, um, you know, that would even give the feminists their due a little bit. But women always patronize men a little, too. You just heard Aaron say women civilize men. Well, how arrogant is that? On the other hand, there's some because truth you to have, it. If you have a small boy as, as a mother, and I've had lots of boys, you have boys, the role that you're put in, and you're held responsible for how your children behave. So the natural role for women is to socialize their children, and it's a good role. Um, but, but my feeling is that, that what, and, this, and it was always in the 50s, a role that women were happy to take, and the fathers also socialized, socialized their children. But that all got lost in this stream of hatred, this lava of disgust and dislike of men. And I still ask the question, I don't get the answer. Why, in 1971, when this movement suddenly reared its head in the Western world, why was the rage so total against men, and what was driving it? Well, I mean, the only I will say that there were frustrations that women had back then. I know, I've talked to enough women your age. There were specific frustrations. But I don't know, I don't know sometimes I think almost... All right, this is a little this is a little politically incorrect, but why not? There's there's something that some of the men some have observed in female behavior called um, the shit test. Um, that women like to shit test their men, and um, it's crass, but it is what it is. Which is that a woman will push a man's buttons and push a man's buttons and push a man's buttons to get a rise out of him, to see how far she can get him to go. And if he doesn't put his foot down and say, stop, she'll just keep going. And sometimes I wonder if ideological feminism itself isn't just the biggest mass shit test in history. I think, and, I think that's probably true. But the other hand, is one of the reasons that, that it's unstoppable, it's also the biggest billionaire movement that women have ever had control over. Well, because they've played on, and that goes to the billion-dollar domestic violence industry. Yeah plays on men's and women's instinctive need to protect women and apparent inability to see women's own violence. Uh, yep. I, I agree with you, but it's there and it's happening and you've got a whole, whole enormous um, edifice out there that is, is coining money, excluding men, so it's jobs for the girls, and until we deal with that first, nothing's going to change. So we stop saying that it is patriarchy, i.e. all men who are brutalized and racist, and we accept that domestic violence has never been a gender issue. It's been a big lie and generational, and we need to begin with the pregnant women and, the, and, the, and the, the children's fathers to educate them to understand that violence damages their children's brains. Then we'll get a result. And I think maybe we've just needed a generation of men, a generation or two of men and women to grow up and look around and say, this is insane. Yeah. Um, I, 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 Andy and I are about the same age. I think I'm a little bit older than him, but I see far more awareness and willingness to speak to the problem in people, especially under 40 and women under 40, than I do people your age, Aaron. So oh, I know. I know. Everyone my age of men simply lay down, put their, their heads, their, their feet in the air and kick them and said, oh, this is so funny. I don't know how anybody could think any of this has any, anything to do with reality. And it's, I was just considered a pariah. 
So I don't know. I mean, social movements take time. Men have to wake up. Men have to even somewhat over, you know, get past their instincts and start thinking rational about things. That's what I think. Andy, why don't you finish your essay for us, and we'll 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 start wrapping up the show here. Okay, big pleasure. Um, irrespective of whether men are reacting consciously, having become aware of their own vulnerability in adulthood, or unconsciously, having been having already internalised the negativity toward them in adolescence, most are doing so on an individual basis. There is, however growing counterculture of males who collectively define themselves to be men going their own way, or MGTOW, a pronunciation of the acronym MGTOW. These are men who positively identify in their refusal to commit romantically to women. Many MGTOWs would disagree with Helen Smith's metaphor of men being on strike, but would prefer to claim that they have simply left the building and are not coming back. Jeff is a typical young man who identifies himself as MGTOW. At the age of 23, he tells me that he was trapped in an abusive relationship with someone who was, in his own words, out to destroy him. He explains that what really affected him was how he had believed all along that it was his role to make a man, as a man to make his girlfriend happy. Therefore, he had felt that whatever was wrong in the relationship was somehow his fault. Several years later, however, he began to find websites where other men had similar stories to tell, and he realized for the first time that he wasn't alone in his feelings or experiences. Looking back, he recalls how amazed he felt to see the things he had secretly been wondering openly voiced by other men. It was as if, all those tiny nuggets of dissent that I'd carefully tucked away for, feeling, for fear of being seen as a sexist was suddenly validated, he says. And he, had, and he adds, I realized that I did not have to, be, have to apologize for being male. MGTOWs can be seen as an offshoot of the wider men's movement, which also encompasses, encompasses egalitarian and traditionalist subgroups. Whereas traditionalists argue for a return to family values, egalitarians accept that the profound cultural changes of recent times mark an end for the traditional sex roles. For egalitarians, the toothpaste is already out of the tube and there is no putting it back. Indeed, many would not want to. Members of all groups claim that contrary to popular perception, it is men who are the ones being disadvantaged and marginalised in society, not women. Now, I'm going to let you into a big secret here, one that hasn't yet reached mainstream consciousness. Outside of the MGTOW groups, a significant proportion of those in the men's human rights movement are, in fact, women. I would estimate that women account for around 20% of those active in the movement falling evenly between traditionalist and egalitarian camps. MGTOWs are separatists, however. They represent a collective rejection by men of the traditional relationship with women, and in some cases, of women themselves. While, it's, while they typically claim to be indifferent towards women, I personally sense a strong undercurrent of anger. Outsiders typically see them as misogynistic. I myself used to feel this way about them, but my view has changed somewhat over time. I now recognize that our tendency to see male descent as misogynistic is nothing other than a symptom of our cultural inability to acknowledge the pain and suffering of adult men, even when it is laid out there before our eyes. It might seem appropriate to dismiss, dismiss MGTOWs as a bunch of angry misfits, but to do so would be a grave injustice. If instead you are willing to look through their, their anger, you will see men who have had their children stripped from them by the family courts, or men who have had their lives ruined by abusive partners and false allegations. Among their number, you will also find the children abused by their mothers, who knowing nothing except what it means to be rejected and disbelieved, have now come to damaged adults. 
These are men who have long since given up waiting for somebody to care about them. Moreover, I have come to appreciate that MGTOW ism embodied a coherent ideology, one which is diametrically opposed to that of the radical feminists of the 1960s, and one which would be extremely confined to many a disenfranchised male. Their philosophy is based largely upon the writings of Esther Villar and her 1971 book, The Manipulated Man. In this, she describes how women coldly, how, how women coldly manipulate men for their own ends, and while some of it may be patent nonsense, I sense that many a man will find profound identification within its pages. Those who read it, having first been suitably broken at the hands of a woman, may forever look upon all women with dark eyes. Just like an iceberg, most of which lies hidden beneath, there is a great body of disenfranchised males out there, with no voice and no one to represent their interests. They lie invisible just beneath the surface of society. If you were to put Esther Villard's book into their hands, I surmise that may cause many to radically reevaluate their world and their place in it. No one controls MGTOWs. There is no central website, no leader, and no particular fan. In any case, men are individually going their own way, whether they realize it or not, and whether women like it or not. Men never retaliated in the gender war that was declared upon them on behalf of all women everywhere by the radical feminists of the 1960s. Instead, slowly at first, they simply began to walk away. One of the few rays of hope is that it would be women themselves who, in increasing numbers, give their support to the wider men's human rights movement, thus providing an alternative to men going their own way. If allowed to continue to its miserable endgame, however, I solemnly predict that the gender war will be a war that all women everywhere will eventually come to bitterly regret. I think that's brilliant, Andy. Thank I you. do too. I do too. And I, I hope you make a good recording of it and put it up as well as get it published. You are talking about, a, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the book again, which is called uh, uh, The Manipulated Man by Esther Villar. Um, it was published decades ago. Um, it's, it's pretty timely. I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of a slogan that goes around, which some people always insist, because they always insist that men are violent, even though by nature men really aren't particularly more violent than women. But what if they had a gender war and the men actually showed up? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, it seems to me like we are. And, and, of course, our way of fighting is to say, well, we're just not going to play with you anymore. I don't think um, men have showed up to I think men are walking away, and I think, that, uh, I think women will eventually come to regret that. Or I should say, future generations of women will come to regret that. Um, well, I think they are. In fact, I think a lot of them are now. Now, of course, some are coming to the realization they're never going to be mothers. Some are trapping men into fatherhood, but even I think men are getting wise to that one. Um, it's going to be rough times the next few years, I'm pretty convinced, but... Here's a thought for you that I'd almost like to close with, although anybody who wants to add anything, let me know. Um, um, feminists may have rightly, 40, 50 years ago, said men won't treat women like adults, men won't treat women like human beings, supposedly, was their thought. Um, well, I, I think men have always treated women like human beings, and that's a, a hateful assertion, but... I do sometimes think, careful what you wish for. If men really completely start viewing women as human beings, exactly the same flaws, limitations, character defects as men, they are going to be starting to take a lot more cynical view of women. And maybe that's a good thing. Um, you know what I mean. Am I making sense? Exactly. I think men need to protect protect women off the pedestal and sometimes hold them. I should say some men do. I think things are changing. I think things have changed radically since my father's generation where, where they put women on a pedestal and they weren't seen as 
as as I would say human, but but they're seen as a, a deity almost. Do you? Uh, what do you think, Aaron? I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think uh, one of my arguments, particularly when I was talking about women, when I stand on platforms in America and say I can't be the only woman who is responsible for my own violence, followed by a deafening sound silence from the women in the audience. But that is the truth. I mean, and men will bend over backwards, particularly judges. I've seen it so often, rather than actually hold a woman to her own behavior. And it, there, there is this thing of, you know, a man looking at a woman and with, with a very natural biological need to protect something weaker and smaller. And that has always been there. But on the other hand, I think hopefully a time's coming when, as you said, Andy, women will be allowed to be women and we can be full of faults. We can be as faulty as men and we can stop now blaming men for everything and take equal responsibility for money. I think that's the supposed goal of feminism. Feminism has failed. Perhaps it's the men's movement that's going to help make that succeed. It's not always going to be comfortable, but I think it's coming, whether it's men going their own way and just saying, I don't care anymore, or getting even more active than that. It's happening. I would like to close the show with a reading from Dr. Helen Smith's Men on Strike. Even though Andy isn't sure he agrees that men are so much on strike as just plain leaving the building and not coming back. Well, I, Either I, way, huh? I, I, I think, I think Mick, Mick tells out that perspective. I don't know. I've not decided yet. And I, I have sympathies right across the spectrum. So I've got a lot to learn in the future. I think society has as well. I think these are interesting questions that are being asked, and uh, hopefully we should get some interesting answers also. I, I believe they're interesting and vital questions and discussions we've been afraid to have for too long. Uh, in closing, I'd like to go ahead and uh, play this. This, again, was the explicit permission of Dr. Helen Smith. is the concluding chapter. It's actually the conclusion of her book, which I strongly recommend, Men on Strike, um, where she thinks about what we've done to men and what we've ceased to appreciate about men. And um, James, can we play Helen's conclusion and then maybe we'll wrap the show, say a couple more things and, and say good night. Many years ago, I lived in New York City for graduate school and I worked as a psychologist for the state. My favorite pastime while walking to work or school was to stop and watch the construction workers building these incredible high structures all across the city. Sometimes they were just working on old buildings to make sure they were in good repair. I would stand with wonder and watch the men as they balanced on beams, hosed down sidewalks, and handled heavy material like it was nothing. Though you might want to get Freudian here, and I think that I had some kind of penis envy, the hose and all, my feeling was one of admiration, not envy. I was grateful that these men were willing to build such incredible structures at the risk of their own life, so that I, and my fellow New Yorkers, might have a better one. By the time I got to work or school, however, the sentiment of my fellow New Yorkers about the construction workers was not so positive. Often, women would complain that the men yelled out some kind of compliment or leer, such as, looking good, or they would smack their lips. I can understand that this was not welcome for most women who just want to get to work or school without a leering squad. However, this is the only quality that these women remembered about the construction workers or men around the city who were providing services to them on a daily basis. The men's better qualities and what they were doing escaped them. Many of the women were very angry and wanted something done about the men looking at them on the street. Gathering them up and putting them in jail for simply looking was fair justice for some of these women. I look around every day at the wonder of men, how many of them are the building blocks of our society, quietly going about their day around my office, planting trees and doing the landscaping, or mowing lawns, running businesses that hire people, working as doctors to help people get better, or just making society a better place by their perseverance and abilities. 
but mainly what our society focuses on now is the negative traits that they perceive men to have. Misandry is so common that no one even questions it. Writer Camille Paglia offers a refreshing exception to this disparagement of men, as pointed out by Christina Hoff Summers. For Paglia, male aggressiveness and competitiveness are animating principles for creativity. Masculinity is aggressive, unstable, and combustible. It is also the most creative cultural force in history. Speaking of the fashionable disdain for patriarchal society, to which nothing good is ever attributed, she writes, But it is the patriarchal society that has freed me as a woman. It is capitalism that has given me the leisure to sit at this desk writing this book. Let us stop being small-minded about men and freely acknowledge what treasures their obsessiveness has poured into culture. Men, writes Paglia, created the world we live in and the luxuries we enjoy. When I cross the George Washington Bridge, or any of America's great bridges, I think men have done this. Construction is a sublime male poetry. Our society has become the angry, leered-at woman who doesn't care that men can build buildings or do amazing things, like be good dads, husbands, and sons. She focuses instead on the small flaws that some men have and extrapolates those to all men. They are all dogs, rapists, perverts, deadbeats, and worthless. Who needs them? We do. Our society has forgotten the wonder of men in its quest for retribution against men and boys who often weren't even alive when women were being discriminated against. Many men understand the war that is going on against them, and they are going underground or withdrawing their talents and going on strike in marriage, fatherhood, education, and society in general. They may not speak about it or use a megaphone to let the world know of their pain, frustration, and anger, or just plain apathy, but it's there raw and just underneath the surface. We as a society must wake up to what we are doing to men before it's too late, and we live in a world that has left male potential in a wasteland. Our society is made better by men who are productive, happy, and treated with fairness. We have only ourselves to blame if we do not turn the tide of the war on men. For without half the human experience, our society can crumble just as surely as those New York buildings would if they no longer had men to work their sublime male poetry on them. Is that the world you want to live in? I don't. And that was a reading done by our friend Diana Davison, one of those uh, female men's rights activists that and you referred to as two before. That was Diana Davison reading that from Dr. Helen Smith's War on uh, uh, Men on Strike. Again, we spent a lot of time. It's a good book. What did you guys think of that little segment? I thought it was beautiful. Yeah, it's wonderfully written. I thought it was beautiful, too. Uh, I grew up thinking there was something inherently flawed about being male and just hearing somebody saying not something nice about us and not shaming us. That felt beautiful. All right, guys. Well, this has been a long show. I apologize to everybody for the technical issues we had during the first half. I want to remind everybody of a couple of things again. We are renaming this show to simply Revelations with Aaron Pitsy. Um, we also want to remind you that MRA London has changed its name to A Voice for Men UK. And you said, Andy, that's going to be a voiceformen.co.uk? No, what did you say it was no, going to be? No, no, it's going to be a voiceformen-uk.com. A voiceformen-uk.com. And uh, the book we spent a lot of time discussing is Men on Strike by Dr. Helen Smith, who we hope to have on a future episode. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. James, take us home, please. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. You have been listening to Domestic Violence Revelations with Erin Pitsy and me, her co-host, Dean Esme. Our show's opening music and closing music is known as Sunshine and Eternal Hope, respectively, and is by Kevin McLeod 
and used under Creative Commons Attribution License, with a link in the show notes. We also want to thank James Huff and Paul Elam, and all of those who are part of the A Voice for Men community for their support for this show. Remember, if you're a victim of domestic violence, no matter if you're a man or a woman, gay or straight, adult or child, no matter what your race, your ethnicity, your religious views, your sexual orientation, or anything else, what you went through or are going through now is not okay. You should not be afraid to talk about it with people who understand and care. Just remember to talk to people who do understand and not to ideologues who fear the truth or will marginalize you and your experiences. Remember, the truth about domestic abuse is often painful to hear, especially to ideologues and especially to those who've been through it and been marginalized and ignored. But remember, in truth, there is hope and healing. And we hope you'll be a part of helping to spread the truth and the healing. Please join us next time on Domestic Violence Revelations with Aaron Pitsy and yours truly, Dean Esme. God bless.